Hi guys, and welcome to the final episode of Logical Redstone Reloaded. Today we'll be making two entire redstone games from scratch, Lights Out and Connect 4. I'm also going to be giving you guys some tips and tricks about the game design process so that you can apply them to your own games. I hope you enjoy. So what's the best way to make a redstone game? Looking out at the blank sandstone world, making a game can feel like an extremely daunting task. Should you start building things right away? Should you draw things out on paper maybe? I mean, where do you even start? Unfortunately, there's no magic formula for how you should build a game. Everyone is different, and it's too complex to put into a formula. But I have some tips that I want to share with you. These are from my own experience and from what I've seen in the Redstone community over the years. And a lot of these tips also apply to any computer science project, not just a Redstone game. But again, it's important to remember that there is no magic formula. So if my advice doesn't work, that's okay. My goal for this video is to just be as helpful for as many people as possible. So, what are these tips? My first big tip is to plan as much as possible outside of Minecraft before you start building anything. It might seem silly at first, but I recommend taking out a sheet of paper and actually drawing the build. Or if you have a drawing program on your computer, you can use that too. Now, don't draw every single wire, just draw the general idea. Make some boxes for the components you might need and draw the general connections between them. The main reason I recommend this is efficiency. Building redstone is slow but drawing on paper is really fast. And as you draw, you might realize there's an issue with it, like maybe something you didn't think about until you saw it visually. Trust me, it's much better to find an issue before you start building rather than after you've already built a ton of redstone. Another option when it comes to planning is to program your game first. I've actually done this a few times. For example, I made my 2048 game in Python before building it. This becomes especially useful when you want to compare the output of your game to the correct simulated output assuming that what you coded is actually correct. But regardless of your code's correctness, this is still a great option, because you'll learn way more about the inner workings of your game by programming it. And if you don't have any experience, well, it's never too late to start. Programming is one of the most useful skills you can possibly have, and there are so many resources for it online. I'll put a few of my favorites in the description. My next big tip is to use something called abstraction. Within computer science, abstraction means to abstract lower level details into a higher level function. In other words, keeping the implementation separate from the functionality. For example, to drive a car, there are really only three things that you need to know. The gas pedal makes it go, the brake makes it stop, and the wheel steers it. Those are pretty much the only functions you need to operate a car. You don't have to know how the engine works or how the circuits work or anything. That's the implementation. So applying this to redstone, take this multiplier for example, which multiplies two binary numbers together. I don't know all the details about how it works because I didn't make it. My friend Sloimy did. But just like a car, I don't have to know how it works to use it. All I have to know is that the two inputs are right here and the output is right here. Three times three, is 9. So you can essentially use other people's redstone without having to know how it works. But abstraction isn't just about using other people's work. The real power of abstraction is the ability to build machines that get more and more complex without it actually feeling like it's getting more complex. To show you what I mean, let's say I wanted to make an 8-bit binary adder, just like in episode 4. To do this, I would start by making the basic logic gates, and once I know how to make them, I can just view them as little symbols, each with input and output. Then I don't have to worry about the implementation anymore. Now, using these symbols, I can construct a half adder. And a half adder is, once again, just defined by some inputs and outputs. So I can make a symbol to represent the entire half adder. Then, using some half adders and another logic gate, I can make a full adder. And finally, using 8 full adders, I can make an 8-bit adder. Notice that at every stage, I never did anything super complex. But if you open up the 8-bit adder and look at all the logic inside, it's pretty complicated. So when you're building your own redstone game, try to use this technique to your advantage. Start by breaking things down into smaller and smaller components, and then build your way back up using abstraction. My third tip is to use mods, because they can save you a ton of time. In the very first episode of this series, I told you guys about my two favorite mods, World Edit and Carpet. And I can't stress this enough, learning how to use these two mods will save you so much time. Also, one thing I forgot to mention in that first video is that World Edit has a schematic feature, which allows you to save redstone builds and paste them in later. You can use this to transfer builds between worlds or even send them to your friends. 
Another really cool mod for Redstone is called Redstone Tools, which was developed a little bit after that first episode. I made a video going through its features. It's a quality of life mod that's literally designed by people like me to save your time. Finally, my last tip is not really Redstone related, but it's still really important. Take breaks and take care of yourself. I know it seems like it's not that big of a deal to play Minecraft for hours and hours on end, because it's just a video game. But when you're making a literal game out of redstone, you're not just playing a video game anymore. You're making a project. And when you're working on a project, you need breaks. Otherwise, you'll burn out really quickly, and ultimately, you won't finish. But I think that's about it when it comes to tips. Let's start making some games. But first, I have to clarify something real quick. At the time of recording this, I've actually already made these games off camera. So if it seems like I'm super lucky because I'm not running into any issues, I'm not. It's just that I've already done all the debugging. Debugging is definitely a huge part of the process, and I'm sorry that it's not going to be in this video very much. But for the purposes of causing as little confusion as possible, I just thought it'd be best to make these games as if everything works perfectly first try. With that out of the way, our first game to make is called Lights Out. Lights Out is played on a board of square cells, where each cell can be on or off. When you click on a cell, it toggles its state, as well as the state of the four adjacent neighbors. You start off with a certain configuration of on cells, and the goal of the game is to turn all the lights off. For example, if the pattern looks like this, I can turn off all the lights by clicking this one, this one, this one, and this one. One thing to keep in mind is that not all starting patterns are solvable. For example, this simple 2x1 board is impossible to completely turn off. But the cool thing is, you can actually generate a complex and solvable board really easily. All you have to do is start with a fully off board and click on it in random places. You know that it has a solution because you can always just do what you did in reverse. Okay, so let's start drawing our design. The first thing I notice about Lights Out is that all the cells have the exact same functionality. So in theory, we can just build one cell and then duplicate it to make a board of any size. From the top-down view, let's make the cell out of a bunch of lamps to show whether it's on or off, and then let's have a note block in the middle for the player to click on it. Now, when the player clicks the note block, two things have to happen. The cell has to toggle its own state, and it has to toggle the state of the four neighbors. The simplest way to do this is to just have a T flip-flop underneath every cell. I covered T flip-flops in episode 7. When the player clicks the note block, we'll send a signal down to the T flip-flop to toggle it, as well as a signal to the four neighbors' T flip-flops. And that's literally it. That's our design. Back in Minecraft, let's go ahead and build the 3x3 of lamps and put a note block in the middle. And let's also put a border around it so that it's easier to tell the cells apart. There we go. Perfect. And then for the T flip-flop underneath, let's go ahead and do a few observers into a block, into a sticky piston, into a redstone block. So when you click on the note block, it sends a short pulse down and it toggles the piston. If you put a lamp right here, you can see that it toggles between off, on, off, you get the idea. Now eventually we want the lamps on top to toggle, not the one down there, but let's just worry about that later. I think the more important thing is to figure out how to toggle the other four neighbors as well. We need some system such that when I click this note block, the T flip flop underneath it toggles, and all four of these toggle as well. The first way I thought to do this was to just split the observer line into four and plug it into all four neighbors like this. And technically this works because when you toggle it, it toggles its four neighbors. The problem is, the wiring is so dense that you're essentially screwing yourself over. Remember, these four cells on the outside see the center as their neighbor, which means you're going to end up having four more signals plug into the center piston, and there's barely any room as is. I mean, I'm sure it's possible, but it just gets really messy. The better approach is to do something like this, where there's a redstone line between each pair of blocks. Now, when you toggle the center, it puts a signal onto all four redstone lines and toggles all four neighbors. And if I toggle this cell, for example, it'll toggle itself and it will reuse just this redstone line to toggle its one neighbor. So now we have exactly the functionality we want. And this is a super easy system to expand. You can literally just make a grid following this pattern. Now, if I toggle any cell, we can see that it toggles itself and the four neighbors. Perfect. And at this point, if you want to play Lights Out, you technically can. You just have to use the display on the bottom. But let's go ahead and connect the T flip-flop to the display on the top. Okay, so I just added this cyan circuit, which takes the output of the T flip-flop and turns on all the lamps. So if we go to toggle it, 
you can see we get that nice spiral pattern turning on, turning off. All we have to do now is duplicate this a bunch of times and we'll have lights out. Okay, here's a nice three by three board. Every cell is on right now, and as it turns out, that's a solvable pattern. If you wanna to try to solve this in your head or on paper, go ahead, I'll give you a second to pause the video. All right, so the solution is to do all four corners like this and the center one. And all the lights are out, so we win. So yeah, that's lights out with redstone. Just a T flip flop for every cell and a little bit of a clever wiring technique. I've included a 3x3, 5x5, and 7x7 board in the world download if you want to play it yourself. The link for that is in the description. Remember, all you have to do to make a solvable pattern is to just start with them all off and click squares randomly. So maybe have a friend do that or something, and then you can challenge yourself to turn all the lights out. The next game I want to make with you guys is Connect 4. This is a pretty well-known game, but just in case, here's how it works. Connect 4 is a two-player game, and it's typically played on a 7x6 board that looks like this. One player drops yellow chips, and the other drops red chips. The players alternate back and forth, dropping one chip at a time, and the first one to get four in a row wins the game. The four in a row can be horizontal, vertical, or even diagonal. The absolute easiest way to make this game in Minecraft is to actually just use sand and gravel like this, but come on, that's kind of boring. Let's make this using actual digital logic. The first thing I notice about this game is that every column can be thought of individually. Dropping a chip in one column doesn't affect any of the other columns, so we can just build one column and duplicate it. And according to the original game size, the column is going to be six cells tall. Now, each one of these cells has to be able to display three different things. Red chip, yellow chip, and empty. But as you probably know, color displays are not great, and I'd rather just use redstone lamps. So let's just represent yellow and red with the symbols X and O on redstone lamps. And when it's empty, it'll be completely off. That'll look pretty good. But now, let's think about how this will actually work. First things first, we know that every cell is going to need some type of memory to store the current state of the cell. And since there are three states, X, O, and empty, that memory needs to be at least two bits. We can't do it with one bit because one bit can only store two things, but two bits can store four things. So let's get really specific about the logic we need here. When the game starts, every cell will be in the empty state. On X's turn, if they happen to choose this column, we need to replace the lowest empty cell with an X. And same thing for O's turn. If they choose this column, we'll replace the lowest empty cell with an O. But finding the lowest empty cell is not the easiest thing in the world. I mean, how do you do that with digital logic? Well, the most straightforward algorithm is to just start at the top, check the cell underneath. If it's empty, move down. If it's not, stop and repeat this until it goes down as far as possible. So at first glance, it seems like we're gonna need some type of shift register, like from episode eight. And while you can make connect four with shift registers, there's actually a better way to do it using just SR latches from episode seven. Let me show you what I mean. Imagine for a second that every cell has an SR latch behind it. If the latch is reset, that means the cell is empty. And if it's set, it's occupied. For now, don't worry about whether it's an X or an O. Just think of the cells as either empty or occupied, according to what the SR latch says. Now, whenever a player wants to drop a chip, all we have to do is this. From top to bottom, send a set signal to every SR latch, and if any latch becomes set, reset the latch above it. For example, let's drop our first chip. We start by setting this guy, and there's no one above it, so we don't have to worry about any resetting. Then we set this one, and because it became set, let's reset the one above it. Then we set this one, and again, it became set, so reset the one above it, and keep doing this all the way down until you get to the bottom. Now let's drop another chip. So again, start by setting this top guy, and there's no one above it. Then set this one, it became set, so reset the one above it, and continue this all the way down. Notice that when you go to set the bottom cell, it stays the way it is, and more importantly, it didn't become set, and so we don't reset the latch above it. And there we go, we dropped another chip. So yeah, if you just set every latch top to bottom and follow this one rule, you can essentially drop a chip on a column. 
The only other thing we have to think about is how to distinguish between X and O. But for that, I think it's actually just easier to show you in Minecraft. So let's head on over and start building. As usual, I'll start with making the display. All right, I made a vertical column with a three by three of lamps for each cell. And then let's have this be O and this be X. I know this is more of a plus than an X, but when it's only three by three, the plus looks much better. So next, let's make the display logic for a single cell so that it can actually show these based on some redstone inputs. We're gonna need two input wires, one for X and one for O, and depending on which one gets activated, that's just what the cell will show. Okay, done with that. So as you can see, when we power this one, we get an O, and when we power this one, we get an X. I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate this for every cell in the column. There we go. Now we can display an X or an O on any cell, which is perfect. Next, let's make the circuit I was talking about that will simulate gravity. I'm gonna do this step by step. To start, every cell just has an SR latch behind it. That's all I've done so far. So you can go to any cell and you can reset it or you can set it. And you can see the state of the latches with these lamps right here. Now remember, when the player drops a chip, the first thing we want to do is literally just set all the latches, top to bottom. Let's do that with a downward torch tower. Okay, there's the torch tower, and as you can see, it literally just sets every cell. Now we just need to make our special rule. The rule says that if a latch becomes set, it resets the latch above it. To do this, we can actually use the pulse generator from episode 7. Because a pulse generator, at least in the way I described it, is really just a rising edge detector. In other words, when the signal behind it goes from low to high, it outputs a short pulse. So if we just take this and attach it to the state of the cell, then we'll get a pulse whenever the cell becomes set. And by plugging the output into the next highest reset, that's our rule. So let's duplicate this for every cell and we should have a gravity circuit. Okay, let's try this out. If we press this button, we drop a chip. And if we press it again, we drop another one. Beautiful. These circuits always feel so magical because it almost looks like a physics simulation or something, but no, it's just latches and a rule. So yeah, we have gravity now. The last thing we need to think about is how to switch between player X and player O. Like I said earlier, we know that every cell needs at least two bits of information to store its three states. And there's actually a really elegant way to store two bits of information with a single redstone component. No, not the comparator, I'm talking about the repeater. Because repeaters are not only on or off, they're also locked or unlocked, giving us a total of four different states. So here's how this is gonna work. We're gonna have a repeater like this for every cell in the column. If the repeater is unlocked, that means the cell is empty. If it's locked, that means the cell is occupied. If it's locked with a zero, it's an O. And if it's locked with a one, it's an X. Let me go ahead and duplicate this so we have one for every cell. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plug the output of the gravity circuit into these locking signals that are on the left. There we go, just like this. And now we can drop a chip for X or O. Let me show you what I mean. If we press this button, which sends a signal all the way down in our gravity circuit, it's gonna come all the way down to here and lock the bottom most repeater. And if we look at the display, we can see that there's an O on the bottom because the repeater got locked with a zero. That makes sense because we weren't powering the back of any of the repeaters. But now let's say it's X's turn. So I'm gonna go ahead and power the back of every single repeater. So if we press this button again, the gravity circuit sends another signal down, which locks another repeater, but this time it got saved with a one, which is X. So let me just combine all these signals together and we should be able to control whether an X or an O gets dropped. Okay, I connected them all with a spiral and I put a lever right here. So now when the lever's on, it drops an X. And when the lever's off, of course, it drops an O. Beautiful. Building the rest of the game was pretty straightforward. I just duplicated the column six more times and I added a reset function, which resets all the SR latches in the entire board. And I added some note blocks at the top of each column so that the player can just right click any of those and it'll drop a chip. And I like doing that because it's a much bigger hitbox than a button. All right, here's the finished game. When this lever is up, it's X's turn and they can drop a chip wherever they want. And when the lever is down, it's O's turn. And of course they can do the same thing. They can drop a chip wherever they want. And oh my, I love the falling animation. It's really cool. 
We didn't do any win-lose detection or anything like that, but I'm gonna be honest, I really don't feel like it. Also, it's kind of annoying to have to flip this lever every time, so you could make a circuit to just switch whoever's turn it is whenever a chip is dropped. That wouldn't be too bad, you could probably just do that with a T flip flop. So that's it for games, but before you go, I want to talk about the future. I want to be super clear, even though this is the end of LRR, this is not the end of teaching Redstone on my channel. The purpose of this series was really just to lay the foundation for learning digital logic. The circuits I included in this series were pretty general, they're usually things that you can do for more than one task. And I did that because I personally think that's the best way to learn. You start by building up a toolbox of general circuits and concepts, and when you want to tackle a bigger problem, like making a game, you bring out the tools and you use them to solve it. But of course, tackling these bigger problems is really fun, and there's so much to talk about. Especially when it comes to stuff like general purpose computers, which I didn't even mention in this series. So even though LRR is over, I've kind of learned that I enjoy teaching way more than I thought. And I'm excited to make more videos like this in the future. They may not take on the exact same format, I can't know for sure, I don't want to make any promises. All I know is that there's a lot more to talk about, and I'm excited to make more videos. If you haven't already, subscribe so that you don't miss any. And before I end, I want to give a huge, huge thank you to those who helped me create this series. Thank you to the members of OR for giving me feedback and helping me find circuits. Also, thank you to my friend Sloime for all kinds of general help. And of course, thank you to everyone watching this. This series would not be possible without you guys. I hope you learned something. I hope you enjoyed. Peace out, guys.